India. 70 years after independence, this emerging world power of more than a billion people is still changing. I'm on a journey to two extremes of this vast subcontinent. It's just crystals, hard crystals. White salt. I'll probably taste it. I began in Gujarat in the far west. This is genuinely incredible. I'm in heaven. It was pretty crowded. And this week, I've travelled 2,000 miles over to the northeast. I'm on the banks of the mighty river Brahmaputra and about to go to a very spiritual place. It's one of India's lesser-known regions. We're really high up. And just to my right is the border with Bangladesh. Wow. A part of the country that prides itself on its traditions. He makes it look so easy and it's incredibly difficult. But it's also looking forward and embracing progress. So now I'm on my way to go and see Assam's very own eco-warrior. It's going to be an incredible adventure. India's northeast, a collection of eight states almost cut off from the rest of this vast country, but for a tiny strip of land. At partition, a large swathe of this region was sectioned off to become East Pakistan, which later became Bangladesh, leaving the Indian area landlocked. It's geographically and culturally out on a limb. This is frontier country, little known to tourists and other Indians alike. They call it the land of clouds, but that's because of the severe monsoon season. Hilly, remote, and the air is so crisp and fresh. And the view is, well, simply spectacular. It's this cool climate that made the state of Meghalaya and its capital, Shillong, a popular retreat for the British during the colonial era. They dubbed it the Scotland of the East. It's pretty crowded. But what about the city today? There's only one way to find out. But we can get on. I take a bus into the city centre. So it's a modern industrial town these days, you know. Oh, feel it. I think those brakes might need a bit of work. <laughs> So tell me, what do you think about Shillong? This is your home city, yeah? Yes. What do you think about this place? The culture here is so different. Like, you see the people, like, you know, they are connected with others, other people. It's not like the rest of India. Here they follow different cultures. More than half of Meghalaya's population belong to the Khasi tribe. And here at Shillong's British-built polo ground, a traditional local sport is thriving. But it sure ain't polo. Every afternoon, hundreds of people gather from all around to take part in a really interesting daily ritual. This is called tear, derived from the Hindi word for arrow. A target's mounted and 50 archers have just a few minutes to hit it as many times as possible. The significance of the sport dates back to the early 1800s, when Khasi warriors defended their homelands not with guns or swords, but with bows and arrows. 
Yeah. I'm aiming for yeah. the target, obviously. Which is which one of them? The, the small one. The small one there. Okay. Now why is it going to the ground like that? Show me. Get out of the way, everyone. Here we go. But no, 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 no. Wow. Now no. that, now we're now getting it. Now we're getting it. Spectators get involved by taking bets on the number of arrows that hit the target. And crucially, it's only the last two numbers of the total score that matter. They all added up, all added up, and the last uh, two digits, that will be the result. Uh, 695 arrows, so 95 is the result. Megalea became one of the few states to legalise gambling in 1982. People here are very superstitious. Mm -hmm. They'll dream about their dead family, a dog, a cat, and they'll try to uh, make it into numbers. So I have 200 rupees of my hard-earned money here. I want to go and gamble. Can you show me how to do it? Yeah. Come on then. So let's go to one of these counters. Hot number in here. Namaste, hello. hello yes, mm. I want to gamble on um, a lucky number, yeah? yeah. Two digits, yeah. lucky number. I'm going to go for 39. 39? Yeah. And I'm going to put 100, 100, 100 uh, rupees on, a, on 39. Oh, and on my other bet, uh, I'm going to bet on 77. Can you fix it so I win? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it depends on your fortune now. It depends on my fortune. I had a dream last night. I had a dream that a, that a, a, that a strange dog walked past me, and that dog had the number 39 on it. Is that the kind of dreams we all have? Uh, who knows? <laughs> Wish me luck. <laughs> It's a tense moment as the numbers are counted. 310, 320. And my dream turns out to be a shaggy dog story. Seven. 77 was my number. 97 was the result. <laughs> Still, two of my lucky numbers. Nine and seven. Next, I head out of the city to explore the region's famed Khasi Hills and villages. Incredible to think that despite landscapes like this, the northeast is one of the least visited areas of India. But things are slowly changing. We've been travelling out of Shillong into the countryside towards the Bangladesh border for about two hours now, and it's been pretty bumpy and rough roads until suddenly we have reached this bit and it's a beautifully smooth road that wouldn't look out of place in a major town. And we're heading towards a village that's got a really interesting reputation. The Khasi Hills are the only place in the world where you find bridges grown from the roots of the India rubber tree, or Ficus elastica. We learned that it was constructed during the year 1840. This bridge was meant for the villagers to cross over the river when they tended to their daily life, mainly agriculture. During that time, there was no partition, no Bangladesh, no Pakistan. So we had that link. During monsoon, the Khasi Hills are hit by record-breaking downpours, more than 20 feet of rain in a month. These are some of the wettest places on the planet. But people here have found an ingenious way to harness nature in order to prevent the village being cut off by floods. Just tell me what they are doing right now. Now they are tying the bamboos to cross on both sides of the river so that the roots of this tree would be woven along these bamboos. Bamboo acts as a scaffolding, which helps connect roots from trees growing on opposite riverbanks. This is skilled and occasionally dangerous work. Yeah. 
Thanks to continuous repairs, bridges like this have stood firm for generations. And will probably remain for many more to come. So we leave Megalea and head to Assam. Passing through some of the 25,000 tea plantations that have made this region world famous. We're on our way to Jorhat, just a few hundred kilometers from India's border with China and the jumping off point for our next adventure. I'm on the banks of the mighty river Brahmaputra and about to go to a very spiritual place, the island of Majuli, which is one of the biggest river islands in the world. Now, there's 150,000 people on that island and only six ferries a day, so it's really crammed, each one. Just looking at the list of prices for all the different categories. Passengers, 15 rupees, it's OK, it's reasonable. Then you go down, past the vehicles, and animals have to pay. Buffalo has to pay 45. Uh, bull, cow, 30. And then the poor elephant has to fork out 907 rupees. Perhaps fortunately, none of these creatures were travelling with us today. And incredibly, after a few last minute panics, we're set to go. I climb onto the corrugated aluminium roof to join men who do this trip day in, day out. Starting in Tibet, the Brahmaputra River is nearly 2,000 miles long. It's second only to the Amazon in the volume of water that rushes through it. So, interesting game of cards going on here. I think they're playing uh, whist. I feel like I should join in, but it may be a private game with high stakes. We arrive at Majuli and it's turmoil again, trying to get off the boat. <laughs> to avoid the queue, there is a sneaky way out, which is basically involves climbing onto another boat and going down the steps that way. Do you know what? I think I'm going to take that one. Well, here we are on land. It doesn't look quite as uh, spiritual as I imagined. And if you look way into the distance, it's just one big flat land of desert. But let's see. Majuli Island is home to 22 monasteries, or satras, initially established in the 16th century by the Assamese guru, Sankadeva. Boys are instructed from a very young age in the religion he preached, Vaishnavism, an offshoot of Hinduism. The monks are celibate, and according to their beliefs, they worship only one god follow a vegetarian diet and reject the caste system. And here at Uttar Kamalabari, the doctrine includes this special art form. performing performing আগুয়াই লৈ যোৱাৰ ব্যৱস্থা কৰা হৈছে আৰু বিশেষকৈ আৰু বিশেষকৈ আমাৰ হত্ৰত এতিয়া সংস্কৃতিৰ মাধ্যমে যে সংস যে এটা আৰ্নিং সোর্স হ'ব পাৰে এই চিন্তাও আৰম্ভ হৈছে This form of classical dance is now recognized by the authorities as a genre in its own right and many of these monks have performed around the world That was Amazing, thank you yeah. very much thank indeed. You. And I know you spend a lifetime yeah. learning the skills of this, but can I have a go? Can I try like this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, our arm is through here. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. First time pace? Yep. Yeah. It's very well. Ah. A. A. No. 
Thế 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 There are 64 positions in this classical dance, and I'm having trouble with the first two. Oh, it's very difficult. One, two, three, let them play. Without the grace as well. No grace whatsoever. Uh, no, no. He, he, he makes it look so easy, and it's incredibly difficult. And I don't think, I'm just going to leave it to the experts, you know, I just, you know, sometimes you just have to give up and let them carry on. An exquisite performance. There's one problem, one very big problem, and that is that this island may simply not exist in just a few decades' time. Hard to believe at the moment, but there is a genuine worry that Majuli will be submerged and destroyed within 20 years. In the last 70 years, it's shrunk in size by two thirds and a majority of the original 65 monasteries have gone. Every monsoon, the Brahmaputra River swells, eroding the terrain around it. Bit by bit, the land is disappearing, but there is hope. So now I'm on my way in a tractor to go and see a man whose life's mission has been to try and tackle the flooding that's afflicted Majuli. He is basically a Sam's very own eco-warrior. Sadly, these are areas that get completely deluged when the monsoon hits. There's some water there that we have to cross. For the last 36 years, Janav Peyang's taken on an extraordinary challenge to save this land from vanishing. Of hard fat oil, the Zabor Jutton Lagisil, Ornasol Podic, Sinar Pragetia, Hab Bengu, Gusia Hill Panit, of hard fat oil, the Tia Potka Panikukaya, Zabor Jutton Lagisil, Zabor Jutton Lagute, Tat Hotadi, Hapaisil, June, July, Mahot, Agot, Jet Mahot, Barakormare, Hebos or Taste Kormaisa, Taste Kormaute, Hapor Mitu, Hoigoisil, Hotadi Hap Mitu Hill. And so his lifelong calling began. Jadav is known today as the forest man of India. He began planting trees so the roots would bind the soil, soak up excess water and prevent the land from being eroded by flooding. From a barren landscape, he's created a forest the size of New York's Central Park. And he feels this will be more effective in saving nearby Majuli than following government flood prevention schemes. The Yar Mulotehol, Mazuli, Bosabolehole, Conquitor, Fresh, Artificial Corribo, Nalagibo. Our Tenecazodi, Mazuli Gutte, Site to Jodi, Gos Cosoni, Rue, Poribe Kundor Koirake, Tetiale, Mazul to Basijabo. So we are now going to do the ritual that every guest that comes here is asked to do, which is to plant a tree. What kind of tree is this? tengagos. So I'm going to put this in here. Yes, yeah, yes. it's good. Jadav has spoken at environmental summits all around the world, and his roll call of guests is equally international. Japan, America, Australia, Switzerland, Netherlands, Thailand, Taiwan. And I do know that everyone who plants a tree 
when it grows, they put a plaque down with their name on it. So I'm going to have that privilege. Wow. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you. And so to my final day in Assam, and a different kind of ritualistic celebration of nature. If there's one recurring theme throughout my trip in the northeast, it's the sense of community, kind of everywhere really, and there's nothing better to illustrate that than this, a local village going down to the river to celebrate harvest. This community was started in 1939 by a young woman who came from the mountains in search of food. Gradually she found that okay, this place is quite better for her because it's close to the water and civilization didn't grow up. So finally she brought, brings a family here, followed by her brother, and this particular village witnesses the entire family of her, her own clan. Really? All come from that one woman? Yeah, that's right. Really? Well, <laughs> fascinating. Wow. This is a much-loved annual celebration, and people of all ages gather to muck in, using fishing methods that have been passed down through generations. Dig it in, yeah, dig it in. A little stumping, like yeah. this, yeah, stumping. Yeah. Then you pull it towards you. Yeah. Oh, well, we've got to pull the, pull the stick, yeah. At the top. And look! <laughs> You can't see this, but oh, got it's just full of fish. Yes. Okay. It's just full of fish. <laughs> this is today's catch. Yeah. Wow! That is pretty good. And this you will cook now? A people on Yeah? Excellent. Wow. Beautiful. Fish. So my trek across India from border to border is almost over, and it's been a real journey of discovery for me off the beaten track. This is an India on tap, kind of instant gratification, which some people are accustomed to. But the rewards, if you make the effort, are immense. Can they bite? Uh -huh. Yeah, it does. It bites? Is it poisonous? No, not much. Not much? Can I get out now? 